and thank the uh, foundation for the support as presenting sponsor. A year ago, Dr. Dever contacted Senator Tim Kaine and broached this idea of a symposium. And the senator uh, gave a tentative commitment. In the ensuing months, he and his staff had worked with us to bring him to our stage. Please welcome the senator from Virginia, the Honorable Tim Kaine. Hey, good morning. Good morning, thank you. Thank you a lot. It is great to be here at Thomas Nelson, and it was an easy thing to do to say yes, because A, the topic matters to me, and B, the woman who staffs my Virginia Beach office, Diane Kaufman, said I had to do it. So I am really happy to be here at Thomas Nelson. I want to thank President Dever for reaching out, and to all the co-sponsors who were embracing this important cause. It is truly a renaissance moment in this country for career and technical education. And I am going to offer some scene setting comments. Um, in fact, the structure of my comments will be as follows. Story, a story about why I'm interested. Policy, what I have worked on and what I am working on. And then another story, the story of a youngster that I've connected with throughout his educational career that I just happened to see again on Saturday. I want to tell you his story, Sam is his name. Start off with a story. Why am I interested in career and technical education? Well, I grew up in a household where my dad ran a company, Iron Crafters. It was an iron working and welding shop in the stockyards of Kansas City. Uh, union organized iron workers. In a great year, there would be eight employees. In a bad year, there would be five employees. Classic American, small business. Uh, and the three brothers in the Kane family and my mom all worked in the business too. And so we grew up, you know, working there on the sh in the shop with my dad, sometimes for whole summers or vacations, but often I just remember the nudge at 6.30 in the morning on a Saturday when I was 14 and thought I was sleeping in, we've got to get an order out today. Dad, I was going to sleep in. I have all these things I want to do today. Son, this is a family business. We've got to get the order out today. So my brothers and I grew up working in this wonderful place, and we saw the artistry of these iron worker apprentices who would then become uh, career iron workers. Uh, my dad used to always say, as the owner, that his business acumen would put his employees' kids through school, and their artistry would put the cane boys through school, and that, in turn, was the case. I learned so much from these wonderful workers and my dad's, but I found at the high school I was going to, there was zero emphasis. I graduated from high school in 1976. There was zero emphasis on career and technical education. My school was somewhat small, a Catholic school, but even the public schools nearby that I might have gone to, if I talked to my friends from the neighborhood who were in these schools, I'm sad to say that circa 1976, the, the vocational curriculum was almost a tracked curriculum that people were pushed into if somebody, a teacher or a guidance counselor, judged that they, quote, weren't college material, whatever that meant. Um, so right from the beginning, I saw the power of career and technical education and skills training. I had a chance to go through college at the University of Missouri. I went to Harvard Law School. I was racing through college in three years in law school. And in the middle of my time in law school, I realized, why am I rushing? I don't know what I want to do with my life. And so I wrote some Jesuit missionaries in Honduras who were connected to my high school and said, can I just come and volunteer for a year? And they said, sure, come along. I had no idea what I would do. When I landed, they said, well, you know, what can you do? I said, well, I'm in Harvard Law School. And they said, that is precisely useless. Um, I mean, for, for anything that we're doing here, what can you do? I said, well, let's see, my dad is an iron worker and welder. OK, well, that actually has some more applicability. The, the missionaries there in El Progreso, Honduras, had just started, like two months before, a school called the uh, Escuela Vocacional Esteban Moya, named after a local leader, it was a vocational school to teach kids to be carpenters. And even though I didn't know much about carpentry, I said, well, look, I can help add a metalworking and welding element to the curriculum. Great. 13 and 14-year-old boys, they'd finished sixth grade, which is as far as you could go in education, most of Honduras at the time. And a two-year curriculum could equip you with technical skills that you could then use to support yourself and your family. That was a a pivotal, pivotal year for me in many ways, but again, pivotal because it demonstrated the power of career and technical education. So that's why I'm so interested in this topic. It, it, it uh, a great shock put my 
brothers and I through college, and we learned the artistry of the wonderful workers and the power of career and technical education, not just to give skills to individuals, but to build out a local, state, national economy. Policy. When I came into elected office, first as a city councilman and mayor, um, and, and as you know, in Richmond and around the state, the school board budgets are heavily dependent upon relations with the local governing boards, boards of supervisors or city council, I started to work in our city schools where my kids attended to try to figure out ways to update career and technical education. Um, and I was still encountering teachers in Virginia. I will never forget talking to a teacher friend of mine, Gigi Pippen, who's in Wise County in Southwest Virginia, middle school teacher, and talking about career and technical education at that period of time in the late 1990s, and Gigi told me, when I see one of my middle school kids who's now in high school, like J.J. Kelly High School in the town of Wise, and I ask them what they're doing, they'll often say to me, well, I'm in the vocational program, sort of with a slumped shoulder, like I'm sorry to have to tell my middle school teacher, because again, there was still somewhat of an attitude that career and technical education, vocational education was kind of a tracked curriculum for kids that somebody had determined, somebody had determined for some stupid reason they were not college material. We started to work on this uh, at the local level when I was mayor to up our offerings and up the respect and dignity we, we might pay to CTE curriculum. When I ran for governor, I came up with a great idea, and, and which my staff made much better. That's the good thing about staff. They take an idea of an elected official, they make it better. But, but I noticed around Virginia that we have governor schools. We have a wonderful one in Richmond that I helped build, Maggie Walker Governor School. It focuses on governmental and international studies. My daughter attended one in Appomattox in Petersburg that focuses on performing arts. You have governor schools here in the, in the Peninsula and Southampton Roads region. But when I ran for governor in 2005, all the governor schools were really oriented toward preparing kids kind of in a magnet way to go on to college. And so I campaigned and I said, can't we just have one governor school that's focused on career and technical education? I mean, can't we just honor the trades and career fields by doing that? I got elected and my staff said, Governor, we got a much better idea. Don't just focus on one. We have 17 governor schools that are college prep. Just set a set of very elevated criteria and then say to the career and technical programs that already exist all around Virginia, if you meet these elevated criteria, we will let you hang a banner in your hall saying you're a governor's career and technical academy. And do you know, just to be recognized, I mean, there was no money connected with it, just to get the recognition as a governor's career and technical academy all over the state, our career and technical programs tried to meet these criteria. The criteria included certainly high academic standards, but industry partnerships, partnerships with community colleges and colleges. There were rigorous requirements about internships that students would have. And the schools rushed to meet the criteria so that they could get the same recognition as being worthy of a governor's school label as the governor's schools around Virginia. By the time I left office, there were nine. Governor Mc uh, uh, Bob McDonald continued the program. By the time he left office, there were 17. By the time Governor McAuliffe left office, there are now 22. And Ralph Northam is continuing. You get the point. Bipartisan, long-lasting, and it's happening organically, and these schools exist in every part of the Commonwealth. When I came into the Senate, I tried to get on the Education Committee. We've got our fantastic Congressman Bobby Scott, who's here. I saw him a second ago. Where is he, Congressman Scott? Please give him a round of applause. Congressman Scott is the lead Democrat on the Education Committee in the House and has been deeply committed to this and so many other important causes. I, I tried to get on the Education Committee in the Senate to keep doing this work, and I remember going to Harry Reid and asking him for committees. I want to be on the Armed Services Committee. Tim, you're going to be on the Armed Services Committee. I want to be on the Health Committee, Health, Education, Labor, Pension. He said, Tim, that ain't going to happen. And I waited for an answer, and that was five years ago, and I've still been waiting. I never got an answer, but... After four years, I finally worked my way onto the HELP Committee. But what I noticed about the Education Committee in the Senate is that at the time I came in, 2013, in the education space, no champions, no champions around career and technical education. There were champions around early childhood, so important, around college affordability, so important, around a whole series of issues, reducing campus sexual assault, so important. Um, individuals with disabilities in education, so important. But there was not a champion at that moment 
in the Senate on career and technical education. So I realize you don't have to be on the committee, you just have to pick an issue that nobody on the committee is championing. And I went to a Republican, Rob Portman of Ohio, and we put together a career and technical education caucus modeled after one in the House. And I started to carve out the expertise in the Senate on the Democratic side on this issue, and finally have now been able to be added to the committee. And we are working on policy issues all the time. And what we're seeing, and this event is proof of this, is it's no longer a matter of trying to push the right policy from the top. There's a tremendous renaissance all over this country, driven by workforce needs, driven by creative educators, driven by people like the speaker that you're going to hear Matthew Crawford, who's just like done such a good job of focusing our attention on this issue, there's a tremendous renaissance in career and technical education going on in the country. Just give you one example of a, of a bill that I'm working on that just is so commonsensical. A lot of trying to promote career and technical education at the federal level isn't even about adopting good policy, it's about changing bad policy. So here's a bad policy. If you qualify for a Pell Grant, income qualify for a Pell Grant, that program can be used in a 14 week long, which is like an academic semester long course. Now you know most academic semester long courses are Monday, Wednesday, and Friday for 90 minutes, so maybe, you know, maybe four and a half hours a week for 14 weeks. So that'd be, you know, nearly 60 hours of coursework or something like that. Well, if you wanted to use your Pell Grant for a 10 week long intensive metalworking class that was eight hours a day for 10 weeks, that'd be 80 hours, um, or, or it would be, let's see, 10 weeks time, eight times five, 40, 40 times 10 would be hundreds of hours. You couldn't get a Pell, you couldn't get a Pell Grant for that. The, the, cl the class has to be the length of a college semester in a 10 week course isn't enough. Not just Pell Grant, military tuition assistance benefit. My oldest son's an infantry commander in the Marine Corps. He has the ability to say to one of his, somebody in his, uh, in his platoon, hey, Captain, I want to go to a community college and get this course that's relevant to what I'm doing. And if he decides it is, he can approve up to $4,500 a year in a military tuition assistance benefit for somebody to go to a college campus and get a course. But if one of his members of his platoon says, hey, I'm a trained ordnance specialist, can I have $300? $300 to pass the American Welding Society certification exam, which if I have it, I can move anywhere in the country when I'm done and get a job. No, you can't do that. It's not on a college campus. So there's a whole series of, of what I would call the institutionalized second class thinking about career and technical education that is in our education policy. But what we're doing, Congressman Scott, through work that they've done in the House to rewrite the Perkins Act, through work that we're doing together now, to update the Higher Education Act. Our goal is to, to redefine higher education. Everybody needs something after high school, but we can redefine it to include not just associate's degrees and not just bachelor's or, or master's or PhDs. Um, in the play, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, somebody said they were ABMAPHID, A-B-M-A-P-H-D, and described ABMAPHID as a gradual wasting away of the frontal lobes of the brain. Um, <laughs> But we want to define higher education so it's not just about AdmaFit, but it is also about the acquisition of career and technical education skills. And that's the reason for the discussion today. Okay, so that's policy. Let me tell you one last story. Story of a kid that I ran into Saturday. His name's Sam. And I have crisscrossed with Sam throughout his life in a most interesting way. When I was governor and we were encouraging the localities to work hard and achieve high standards and then their career and tech center could be a governor's academy. One jurisdiction that did it was Arlington. They had a wonderful career and tech program and they worked hard to achieve the governor's label and it's now the, let's see, Governor's Career and Technical Academy of Arlington is the, uh, this organization. And they, they began in 2008. At that time, I think Sam was a freshman in high school. Arlington started this up. And one of the areas they focused on, they had a number of different focuses, but was allied health fields. They had EMT and other type courses. I didn't meet Sam. I went to the Arlington program, and he might have been in a big group, but I didn't meet him until I was running for the Senate in 2012. I'm running for the Senate, and this little kid, now in high school, is at an event, and his mother forces him to come talk to me. Go tell Tim Kaine 
about career and technical education. So Sam kind of is forced by his mother to come converse with me. And he says, well, I'll tell you my story. And here was his story. He was in high school. He was smart, but he wasn't getting good grades. He was a C and a D student. And his parents were at their wits end. We know our child is smart. We know our child can achieve. He doesn't seem very motivated. And then they, they were smart. They said, well, what, what is an area where he's showing motivation? And they said, you know, Sam, that kid will watch Scrubs three times a day if it's on. He seems pretty interested in kind of medicine and stuff. And so they said, listen, why don't you go to the Governor's Academy in Arlington and take an EMT course? I can do that. I'm only a high school sophomore. I can do that. You can do that. I'd really like to do that. So he starts to go to the, he's going to Yorktown High School, but he starts to go to the career tech program, take an EMT course, and he absolutely loves it. Now he's happy, now he's working hard, now they found this motivational connection that's helping him learn and grow, and then they get his grade card. Wait a minute, where, where were the C's and D's in the science classes you were taking? Now you're an A student. What happened? Well, it was about memorization before I was at the Career and Tech Center, and now it's not about memorization. Now I see the connection between what they're telling me I have to learn to pass an SOL and what I really like doing. So by the time Sam's mother made him talk to me, he was now graduating from Yorktown High. He was graduating with a great GPA. He was about to go off to the University of Miami, and he said he was going to be pre-med. Last time I saw him until Saturday was in 2012. Saturday, I was in an event in Fairfax, and a father came up with a 24-year-old. said, hey, do you recognize this kid? I said, no, I don't. Well, Sam, <laughs> Sam, tell the senator about what you're up to. And Sam comes and says, well, don't you remember me? I mean, I was the kid you last talked to when I was heading off to the university. Okay, I do remember you. What are you doing? He goes, well, I went to the University of Miami. And I was going to go pre-med, and I started taking all these health classes, but I really got super interested in physical therapy. And then I started to get interested in physical therapy and technology. So I decided not to go to med school. I've now graduated. And with three people here in the last two years, I've started a technology firm called Kinemetrics. And the idea is to use technology solutions to help doctors gauge the progress of patients undergoing physical therapy for rehab purposes. You know, so how, how much are you improving? How much are you getting better? Are you slacking off on your regimen or are you actually doing your regimen? And we've developed all these technology projects to help physicians and physical therapists gauge the success of their patients undergoing physical therapy for rehab. Here's something we're discovering about career and technical education. First, there's so many fields that need CTE workers that uh, focused curriculum in these areas train people for all kinds of wonderful jobs. Second, getting people some connection into CTE programming, it, it, it's like it just casts a spotlight and suddenly illuminates why the rest of education is important. Instead of there being a light turned off and it's kind of dark and obscure and why do I need to know this? Oh, now I know why I need to know this. But a third thing we're discovering, and I'm finding this because I'm going to career and technical centers all over the country, is people who have some background in career and technical fields are more likely to start businesses. They're more likely to start businesses than, go, than folks who go through a traditional college curriculum. I met an individual who um, was from Waynesboro recently, and he was at the career center when he was at Waynesboro High School. And when he got out of Waynesboro High School, he was accepted at UVA, but he was also accepted at um, uh, Blue Ridge Community College in Weir's Cave, which is near Waynesboro. And he could continue in this career and technical center when he went to Blue Ridge Community College. And he was weighing, do I go to UVA or do I stay working and going to the community college? And he, and he decided, I'm going to stay working at the community college. And he didn't go to UVA. And he stayed at the community college. And the company that he was interning for, by the time he graduated from uh, Blue Ridge Community College, he bought the company. The owner was getting ready to retire, and then this youngster who had started working there in high school bought the company, and he said something fascinating to me. This is now 15 years ago, and he's on the board of the tech center to help other students like him have the same kind of experience he does. He said, had I gone to UVA, I know I would have done well, and I bet I would have had a good career, but I think I would have had a good career working for somebody else. But by doing this, I've had a great career, and I've had a great career working for myself. Obviously, training people to be entrepreneurs, innovators, start businesses 
is something that we all ought to be thinking about, and there's starting to be evidence that a focus on career and technical education increases people's desire and willingness to and ability to risk take to start their own businesses. So that's what this is about today. It's about equipping each other uh, with the skills to extend what we do from the early time in students' life to make sure they understand the spectrum of what's out there for them and make sure we fully value career and technical education. Last thing I'll say is I'm going to quote a famous ex-governor of California, I'll be back. <coughs> um, <laughs> Congressman Scott and I are going to host in June uh, a workforce session around a 305, 355 ship Navy. We have made a commitment as a country that we want to build up from 270 up to 355 ship Navy. It's going to take a long time. But as uh, Jennifer Boykin at the shipyard says, that means that the folks who are building, be building carriers and subs are in pre-K right now. And we don't have all the workers to do these. And by the time we're building some of these, a lot of the workers we have will be retired. So we have to have an educational system, an interconnected system from pre-K all through college in, and our union apprenticeship programs and our standalone career and technical program. We have to have an interconnected system that will expose people to these opportunities and encourage them to take them. So within a month, we'll be back talking about this very particular issue of how do we get to a 355 ship Navy and how do we produce the workforce that's capable of doing not just the construction but the refuelings and repairs here in Hampton Roads. Thank you for letting me kick off today. It's going to be a wonderful day and I'm, ex I'm just so excited. R raise your hand if you are a career and technical education educator. Raise your hand. Let's give them a round of applause. We, we expect a lot out of you and I think we're finally getting to the point where we're going to give you the attention and the resources you deserve. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Senator, for those inspiring words and especially those uh, stories. John